Well, you know, it's been devastating um, for both community members as well as, you know, on the national level and international level. It's been somewhat of a challenge to, uh, to assure folks are safe that they're remaining at home, that they get their vaccine if and when they can, um, and spreading the good word that, uh, you know, th this is a serious, you know, COVID-19 is a very serious uh, virus and it's spreading and the variance is a deep concern of mine and so we all have a responsibility to take care of each other so it has been a somewhat of a, an, unusual, an unusual year just in the last 12 months absolutely um you know last february of 2020 um, we were notified um, from Oregon Emergency Management at a meeting in Portland that there was a virus it wasn't defined at that time it was called corona as you uh, as well as some of you should know that and it's kind of escalated to uh, the COVID-19 as it's defined today um, as a result of that the challenges <laughs> you know facing the daily routine the daily updates with both tribal council on the daily um, routine from 7 30 it used to be to as long as it takes to decide the data to analyze the effects it was having on communities on a national level so all those had to be considered so we were brief you know doing a daily brief in the tribal council and, it, and the community members as well it became somewhat of a challenge because i don't think any one of us were prepared uh, and I say that honestly, um, although we have a good emergency operation plan, Sue, it didn't seem to be affected in the sense that this was a new virus that did different things to different people and, and was spread in, shutting down schools, shutting down organizations. Um, so we had to make some sound decisions to protect our community members as well as our partners, as well as our adjacent communities. And so we all came together and uh, met with Tribal Con. So we had to put together contingency plans. We had to work with our neighbors of St. Charles Hospital and Public Health and Oregon Health Authority, as well as Indian Health Service. And it included a number of other agencies um, from FEMA to the emergency management perspective. So we had to come to a conclusion what was best to serve this community, particularly this community, because this is where we live. So it was, yes, it was a daily brief in the tribal council, very, um, very forceful to share what we knew and, and dealing with the tribal council that didn't really know how to deal with it any more than us became somewhat of a challenge. So the chairman immediately appointed a team of COVID-19 folks. And with that being said, yes, I'm part of that team and it's routine, it's daily, it's tracking the data, sharing it with KWSO and our neighbors and them sharing that data with us was imperative. I mean, and it's a daily thing. Um, it could change right now. Um, as you know, um, we had a shutdown. I'm um, told folks to stay home um, where it was safe and sound, where a lot of us had to re come to work to keep track of that data, making sure that our community members were taken care of. So um, very, very struggling and very um, determined to take care of those that needed to be taken care of. And as you know, it affected a lot of our elders. It affected our language. It affected our traditional way of doing things from Payamcha to uh, other events we had to cancel. So it was a devastating effect um, for these events and for our community members, and it still is to some extent. Absolutely, you know, it's, you know, like you've indicated, the wildfires came upon us as well as the COVID-19, as well as the water crisis, um, as well as losing the sun as a result of the COVID-19. Um, and a number of other community members, it, it became somewhat overwhelming to kind of, um, and I'll be honest with you, overwhelming and heartbreaking. But at the same time, um, trying to be optimistic that we had an obligation as a community and as a community member to, to take care of our neighbors, to take care of each other. Um, it wasn't easy. Um, you know, so a lot of times, I, you know, out of frustrations, um, as I went home, I, I have a wife that listens, that, that allows me to express myself. And that took care of 80% of my grief, but it certainly wasn't taking care of other folks' issues. Point being is, 
The wildfires was a challenging time. Um, probably the worst wildfires I've seen in a long time in Warm Springs. On top of the air quality issues, the water crisis, <laughs> um, giving out and dispersing water. Um, you know, a lot of community members came together to help us, not so much dispensing the water, but donating water um, from St. Charles Hospital to um, folks from Washington to Idaho to um, other tribal nations. They, you know, they, they seen our struggles. Um, and we did a lot of interviews. We, we, we requested donations because the tribe was in an economic disadvantage to get those resources in. So we turned to other resources. And, and I was so pleased and so appreciated that other community members seen our need and, and stepped to the plate. I mean, we ended up with a million gallons of drinking water. I mean, <laughs> oh my gosh, you know. So, but the air quality became somewhat of another challenge as, you know, the air quality was getting bad, fires were getting bad, people were nervous about staying home, the virus was running rapid, we were dealing with a lot of death-related issues, you know, um, it was non-stop, 24-7s. Um, yes, it wore me down, but I had to be optimistic and rely on strengths, your strengths, the community's strengths. Um, you know, thank God I got this happy looking face because I think that pulls me out 90% of my struggles because people seem to think I'm okay, but underneath the grin, I got a lot of agony and pain for my people and, and for our communities. So I, I'm, I'm blessed with that so I could move forward, but it isn't easy. I know there's better days to come, um, and I really truly believe that. I think with the vaccines now coming out, um, we've all got our double shots. Um, I want to encourage community members, it's safe, it's okay. Um, it's okay to feel a little pain. What you don't want to experience is somebody dying in your family, somebody that's going to get really sick if they don't get the vaccine. It's okay to be fear, have fear to get the shot. I've gotten them both, and yes, it hurts but it would hurt more when you lose a loved one. And I had to deal with that. Um, you know, a son that had no opportunity to get a shot, um, didn't even know he even had the virus until he died. So anyhow, is there gonna be a lesson to be learned? Um, if not, um, shame on us. Maybe we haven't done our very best to, to let this community know that, you know, the health choices they need to make, but I really truly believe everybody now realizes this is real. This, there's no turning back. Um, we have to change it. And the only way we're going to change it is education, prevention, awareness, um, and let people know that it's not okay to walk around these days without your mask, without hand sanitizer. It changes the rules, but in time, it will get better. It's a tragedy within, um, here I'm at work, and, and I feel so guilty, I, and, and I know I shouldn't, and I know I've been sharing that thought with a lot of friends, including my wife, guilty in the sense that I was pouring out more to my community than my own family, which is somewhat of a guilt. Um, he was in Vegas um, and caught the virus. Um, we hadn't heard from him about a month, a uh, month and a half, and. Um, his auntie, it, thank God, she put out a notice that normally he calls weekly. And of course, again, I felt guilty that I wasn't there to accept his calls, even though I said, hey, I'll get back to you. But nonetheless, it became somewhat of an, uh, an issue putting in a missing report. Um, he sat in the morgue for almost 28 days. Um, nobody knew who he was. Um, and as a result of that, a sheriff kind of put one to one together and notified us that, hey, we think your son's at this morgue. Um, yes, it, it puts the brakes on. Um, you, you automatically realize, um, you know, you got to stop what you're doing and focus now on dealing with a, a tragedy, a loss. Um, the pain that I went through was anything I, I can't, you know, I can't describe it, but I was definitely hurting and I immediately make we made decisions to get him home. Well, getting him home was more of a challenge. Flying him home wasn't an option because he was a COVID-19 case. Um, trying to find a flight, which there was none, and then if he did, it was a cost that I was willing to pay, but the airlines wasn't willing to do it. So his, uh, you know, his brother and I and my nephew, uh, we drove down there to get him.
at Vegas um, in the middle of August. You, know, you don't want to drive in the middle of August in Vegas because it's 119. So we got down there just to find out the paperwork, um, the transition of going from point A cross country back to Oregon was somewhat of a, a delay. Um, and we had to make some sound decisions with the morning, who was very polite with me, but I was there for one reason, get my son home. With that being said, um, you know, we had to get the, you know, the paperwork, the death certificate, you know, and it takes time. I mean, and it, time wasn't on my side. I wanted to get him home. He'd been there 20, now 28 days. Um, so we had to use what's known as some language that indicates Native Americans that are from reservations that are descendants of tribal, federally recognized tribe, has every right to be released back to their home front without any delays. So we forced that on them and said, this is a Native American, he needs to come home with me, end of the subject. And they were a little bit caught off guard, I was too, and Howie Arnett's when I encouraged me to use that force. They didn't argue, they gave me my release, and we drove straight home. It was, um, when we left Vegas, it was 118 degrees. So my determination to drive straight through was just that, and we did. We drove straight through through the night, um, one way. Um, nervous about getting pulled over with the coffin behind your pickup. You know, you have all these, you know, you pull in your gas station, hey, what's back there? Um, so there was some humor behind it but very painful. Um, we got him here, we, we did our services, and we put him in the ground. Um, that was my objective, and that's what we did. We knew we couldn't open his casket. I could never see him again. And um, that's how that concluded.